Hello, everyone. Um, I'm just gonna I'm just gonna kick things off just to maximize content for this for this session. Um, just to say, first of all, that um, Giancarlo Crosetti is is on his way. Don't worry, he hasn't been eaten by a conference goer. He will arrive hopefully um, at some point uh, during the session. Some public transport issues. Um, so, over the next um, 55 minutes or so, we are going to answer the simple, narrow question that is, is you know, so specific that I'm not actually sure how we're going to fill the time. Um, how to rebuild an agenda for Europe. Um, I should introduce myself. I am Sumeya Keynes. I am an economics columnist at the Financial Times. Um, we've got a great panel here. Um, we're going to hear from Marco Buti of the European... Uh, University Institute Rolf Strauch of the European Stability Mechanism, eventually Giancarlo Crosetti of the European University Institute, and Ellen Ray of London Business School. Um, my law of moderating panels is that I should say as little as possible. So, um, Marco, why don't you start with your take on this question? Okay, thank you very much, uh, Sumaya. Um, I'll draw my initial remarks essentially from uh, a manifesto for Europe that was published at the beginning of October actually undersigned by some people uh, in, the, in the panel and uh, several of you in the audience. Uh, so, vast program. Um, uh, let me concentrate on the um, why, what, uh, and uh, a little bit on the how uh, also. I think on the why we should rebuild um, an, a new, an agenda for Europe, I think essentially because, and this is the w one of the key messages in the, um, in the manifesto, that by, the way, by the way, the manifesto was published in Vox uh, uh, CPR, so it's uh, part of the family uh, here. So, okay, on the why, I summarize in three times two. Okay, two is, the first two is um, um, the increase in median age over the past uh, uh, 10 years in Europe. Um, so, demographic uh, uh, pressure is there with us uh, already. It's not, you know, in a distant future. The second two is on technology. Basically, if you go back to, uh, uh, I think, a nice study by McKinsey of about or less than a year ago, you will find that uh, out of 10 uh, leading technologies, Europe manages in two of them. Uh, interestingly, um, it is behind in uh, technologies that uh, tend to have uh, more externalities and count on uh, um, uh, increasing return. So typically those that you know, a large actor should uh, finance. And what is interesting also is that you have production, you have adoption, and innovation, Europe is non, uh, no uh, leading in uh, innovation in, any, in, in adoption in any of the technology. So the issue is that you know, making a difference uh, is simply not uh, there. And the third two is the uh, macroeconomic ones, is the current account surplus. After some wobbling figures are, uh, around the um, the pandemic, uh, we have gone back uh, and we basically, Europe subtracts, uh, subtracts uh, uh, demand from the global economy on a persistent basis. So, uh, demography, technology, and the macro uh, lead to the conclusion that uh, um, the European business model as it stands is not sustainable in the longer, uh, in the longer run. So, what what to do uh, here, um, the manifesto makes seven recommendations. I think you can find them, so I'm not going to illustrate uh, um, all of them. I just a couple of uh, key messages. Okay, one is that uh, we have to rethink the fiscal. Uh, here, it, it means uh, rethinking the fiscal on, uh, on the rules, but also on vertical coordination between what we do at the European level, what we do at the national level, and the, um, an important point that the manifesto makes is that we should reorientate the um, interventions at the EU level on uh, uh, European public uh, goods uh, of different sorts, economic and non-economic, uh, non um, addresses some of the 
the shortcomings that have been indicated uh, um, uh, before. Um, we have to have a, try to have a different take on classic debates. So I think if you look at capital markets union, it doesn't make a difference on the ground. Banking union, you have Germany and Italy basically having painted themselves in opposite corners and not ready to move. So I think on these matters here, let's say financial issues more generally and financial integration, I think the idea of having a different take, looking at the contribution that completing this uh, chantier will have uh, on uh, uh, the double transition, so green and uh, digital, the implication that this has on the um, a geopolitical role of Europe, I think, is, uh, uh, is important. Now, on the how, and I finish here, the most difficult issue of all. I was reading just a minute ago the priorities of the Belgian presidency for the next six months. So they take, on, they take over the reign of uh, Europe in, the, um, in January. The beautiful on, the, on what to do, silent or reticent on the uh, when and, and, and the how. So not ready to put the money where the mouth uh, is. So I think we have to uh, change that. So how do we do that? I think one key issue here is that we have to overcome the legacy that is be, uh, still with us from the global financial crisis, sovereign debt crisis in Europe, of having the, the Europe split between creditors and debtors. Um, I think we are in a situation of endemic uncertainty. So those who were on the winning side in the past years are not necessarily going to be on the winning side today or, uh, or, or tomorrow. Uh, so the, the uh, uncertainty that we have now, this endemic uncertainty, has recreated that veil of ignorance that John Raoul said that should be there when we make reforms, and particular reforms in this case uh, of European uh, of European system. Uh, and we have to move, uh, I think, on a two-way concept of solidarity, according to which is not, you know, one way always uh, from the money from the north to the east or to the uh, or to the south, but you know, a two-way solidarity, which I think uh, it can be can be re-established if the, if we take into account uh, that um, you know, shocks uh, in the future are not necessarily always putting the uh, countries on the one side, winning side of defense or on the other side. Okay, apply these principles of what is uh, happening right now in Brussels on the negotiations of the Stability and Growth Pact and you draw your own conclusions. <laughs> Thank you. So I am one of the signatory of the text that uh, Marco uh, mentioned. However, I'm not going to uh, stick exactly to uh, the text, but I, I obviously agree with a lot of things that Marco said. So I'm going to make uh, three points. The two first points are probably you know, not that original in the sense that I'm going to be mostly endorsing some um, proposals which have been discussed and I, which I think are, are, are particularly important. And the third point will be maybe a little bit more out there. I'm going to put a little bit more of my academic hat there to, uh, uh, to challenge a little bit uh, uh, some established uh, way of, uh, of doing things. So the first point is about uh, capital market union. And there I think it's, it's very clear that, uh, as everybody knows, we are going to be needing a lot of investment in the coming years for the green transition, in particular, so the European Commission has even put a number, 600 billion, around 600 billion yearly, uh, between now and, uh, and 2030, which is a huge amount. And in order to mobilize uh, private funds, private investment, we need a capital market union. And on, on there, there's a great speech of uh, Christine Lagarde, uh, who has uh, mentioned, and I think she's right, that the, we have been discussing these issues for a long time, and the bottom-up approach has totally failed. Uh, we haven't been making any progress. So she's essentially proposing a top-down approach. Uh, what does it mean? That would be in effectively creating a European SEC. Uh, and what would that look like? Well, it would be a, a beefed-up uh, ESMA, 
which would have a single rule book, direct supervisory power, and also, of course, enforcement mechanisms. So I think that could, uh, that has the potential for really making a difference, and that would be a first very, uh, relatively, of course, not simple to implement, but simple to understand, I think, a proposal that could uh, uh, do a lot to unlock some additional lending uh, within the EU. Now, the second point is about, and I think it's also a very important point, is about institutional reform. And there, I think what is uh, pretty clear is that uh, decision processes have to be reformed uh, within the European institutions, so we have to move from the veto to the quality, uh, to the, uh, uh, to the qu uh, quantitative, <laughs> qualified majority voting, sorry, <laughs> quantified majority voting. Uh, obviously, it's, there are different ways of doing this, and you can tailor it a little bit, and on this, uh, there is this uh, very nice uh, report of uh, the group of 12, which is a Franco-German working group, which has been tasked on giving some idea to uh, reform the institutional uh, the EU uh, institutions. Now, it seems pretty clear that the EU cannot be, uh, you know, subject to blocking blackmail of some members, especially if they are under Article 7, uh, for uh, messing up with the rule of law. Uh, it's uh, also disturbing, I think, that we could have a country which is under, under Article 7 that could be taking the rotating presidency of the EU. Um, I think it's, these matters are very, very important for the legitimacy of the decision of the EU, the effectiveness, and I would go even further. I think that uh, if we do not um, do more on these matters, then we make the EU much more vulnerable to external interf interference by foreign actors, uh, which is a big issue, uh, also given uh, the current geopolitical climate. So uh, not only uh, the reform of the decision process uh, should be you know, sped up or really be implemented, but also we have to widen budgetary conditionality uh, that should be uh, strengthened and uh, widening the scope of financial penalties would be a good way to proceed. Again, there are some uh, interesting ideas in that regard in the uh, Group of 12 uh, report. Third, and that's uh, the idea which is uh, maybe a little bit more out there, I think uh, it's pretty clear, and this goes back to some of the things that Marco has said, uh, that we have been uh, doing very little, or uh, not enough anyway, regarding the financing of European public goods or or actually global public goods. And uh, there is really an inaction, but I would call an inaction puzzle there from an economic point of view. So we systematically tend to do uh, too little too late. So by uh, global public goods or European public goods, I can mention, of course, pandemics, financial stability, climate risk, uh, biodiversity loss. So these are all kind of global public goods or European public goods, depending on how you, you look at them. And the fact is that once the risk of, uh, you know, of pandemics or financial stability or climate risk, when, once the risk materialized, we incurred very, very large costs, uh, which definitely impaired debt sustainability. We have been seeing that uh, over and over again. So uh, there's a very simple uh, kind of way of trying to change a little bit the thinking, which is that if we had a more prudential approach, so if we invested earlier, um, then uh, we would improve debt sustainability instead of uh, having these huge losses that uh, increase our, our, our liability. So how, how would that work, or how should we think of that? It's a little bit of a, you know, an approach of dynamic scoring, in a way, uh, uh, to, um, to some specific risk. So if we think about uh, current fiscal frameworks, they usually assess debt sustainability by forecasting some kind of debt-to-GDP path, future deficits, and refinancing needs over certain horizons. But the forecasts are systematically built on median scenarios, which don't take into account, really, the likelihood and severity of crisis, uh, which will happen, or in the case of COVID, actually, once uh, the epidemic, once the pandemic started, we knew would happen. We even had actually studies, and for example, Shebnem, uh, uh, who will sp speak later today, had studies about the effect, the economic cost of COVID on the world economy, looking at interlinkages and things like that. So we, we can expect that cost, and yet 
we seemingly do not take into account those uh, future liabilities when we look at uh, fiscal costs and the sustainability of our public finances. And because we ignore these future liabilities when we uh, look at debt sustainability calculations, the incentives to act now to decrease those risks are weak. And we end up in much worse fiscal situations exposed later. So just a, a very quick example here. If we think about COVID cost, so the French GDP declined by around 6% during COVID. Uh, the, fiscal, the decline in fiscal revenue was about 70 billion, okay, which was just, uh, it's, it's just the fiscal revenue. So if you think uh, about additional uh, items on the fiscal side, that's uh, obviously even much bigger. Now, at the time when COVID started, so we started to have different scenarios about the effect on the world economy. Okay? And since we are all interlinked, obviously the COVID effects with all our trading partners had a big effect on our own uh, income, on our own GDP. Now, taking that into account, you could project that we would pay if nothing was done to stop the pandemics at the global level, we would pay a very high cost. Again, depending on the scenarios, it would be in the tens of billions, right? So if we had taken that, if we can take that into account and think about, in the case of COVID, the cost of vaccination, the cost of helping Africa uh, spread the vaccination, etc., those costs were not that high. They were also in the tens of billions, all right? So imagine that the EU had coordinated in order to pay for this global cost. In fact, the debt sustainability of the EU would have been improved by making this investment upfront. Okay, so this is the kind of principle of uh, prudential uh, fiscal management that I think should be applied at the EU level, potentially with the EU budget, and of course, the larger the area, the more it will internalize the benefit of dealing with a global risk. At the level of a single country, France, come back to that, uh, to, to my example, so had a huge cost, seven, the order 70 billion, um, that was the, uh, one of the, the, the COVID cost. Now, if it had invested the whole, let's say, 50 billion estimate that the IMF put out at the time to help vaccinate the world, well, that would be a, uh, that would be a huge, that would be a large fiscal cost and it would internalize only a little bit of uh, the decreasing risk because the risk is, is global, okay? Uh, however, uh, if, you, uh, if you are a large area and that applies to climate risk uh, very much, then you're gonna internalize a lot of the benefits of actually decreasing the risk. Hence, it would be very logical for the EU as an area to think in those terms, in terms of uh, prudential management of uh, the public finances. And I think I'm over my time, so I'm gonna stop. <laughs> Thank you, okay. And welcome to Giancarlo. <laughs> um, <coughs> sorry, uh, click the works. So, okay. thank you very much. Um, what are the long-term challenges for Europe? And long-term, but probably can operationalize, say, over the next 10 to 20 years, 10 years. So if you ask that question, you get a lot of answers, obviously. And my way of thinking about it is basically focus on three areas, which is demographics, aging, climate change, and geoeconomic fragmentation. Marco, you, you proposed a different kind of standing or kind of classification on this, and there are obviously very many ways to think about it. The point why I like to think about those three items and terms is because I also feel that, particularly with the focus on geoeconomic fragmentation and climate change, we have you create a political window of opportunity. Those terms, those threats, those challenges create more, in my perspective, more political dynamics, and that's the point that one could exploit um, on, on a policy agenda. Now, the first point to recognize as we get out of the pandemic and as we get out of the, um, the uh, Ukraine conflict and the cost push shock, that countries are in a very different situation in addressing those challenges. And that's an issue per se, 
What you see here on the left-hand side is the expected cost of higher interest rates and aging over the next decade, and you see that countries are differently f affected by them, which will affect their fiscal capabilities of addressing the challenges. On the right-hand side, you see the exposure of countries to imports from BRIC countries, which also varies across the euro area. Again, and that creates kind of the inherent need and logic also to take care of country strategies at the European level. That is, I think, the, the starting position that we have to be aware of and that needs to be addressed. Then the question is, if you want to do something and build a policy agenda, what is the area to look at or how to, what are the principles of it? And in my view, there are basically three principles on which the EU is built and which we should invoke here and which should give guidance. It's clearly the single market. It's solidarity, which is a fundament of European politics from the start with cohesion policy and has had many more ramifications later on in terms of next generation EU. And it's very crucially subsidiarity. There must be a justification for the EU to act. We know that always comes up. It's economically meaningful, but it's also politically extremely meaningful because member states want to defend their interests and exactly the point that you said on how uh, has to take that into account. Now, if you think along those lines, there is still a lot that can be done uh, in terms of building a policy agenda, both at the European level and at the national level. And obviously, also in line with what you said, Helen, the issue of what can be done at the European level is built on preserving the single market, pooling resources where it's efficient, and addressing spillovers. These are the key areas where Europe should have the chances to act and can actually have additional value added and that should be exploited. And that means strongly we're in those areas where you have technology, the pooling of technology makes sense, you create scale, where you can gain efficiency through insurance, that makes a lot of sense, there you should, there you should also act. And there is where you can create European mechanisms while at the same time you need to preserve and you have all the national areas of competencies and policies that, need to, that, that they have to handle. Think about migration. There should be a common external border policy that needs to be preserved. But at the same time, it's clear that the integration of migrants will be done at the national level, and there are national schemes that deal with it. So there's different parts that Europe can play in terms of providing a public good or having a coordinating role. And those should be formulated clearly for that policy agenda. If you think this more concretely through, from my perspective, there are a few areas, and some of them were mentioned, that we need to address here, and I have listed here four points. One is we need to build a financial infrastructure post-2026, when next generation EU is done. In that financial infrastructure, there should also be a clear division of labor between what different institutions do. I think there's a very clear need to rethink th what the EU budget does and maybe the size of the EU budget, but also the interaction of the EU budget with other institutions, such as the ESM or the European Investment Bank. And maybe one is more in charge of providing public goods, another institution more in charge of providing insurance. That division of labor should be clarified. We need to advance in market integration. CMU was mentioned, banking union is mentioned, that is clear. It's also clear that there are very, very big questions on how to get there. And Part of the clearly the, ne the, the need for the next institutional cycle is to be much more uh, precise on, on, on this how. There is, a, in terms of coordination, much more need to have clearly defined strategies, which are not necessarily in under the responsibility of the EU, but where coordination plays a big role. And in that regard, I fully agree with what was said before. There's also a need to streamline EU decision making and prepare for EU expansion. EU decision-making, qualified majority is a key issue. And certainly if you think forward and Ukraine and the aspiration of Ukraine in joining, there is a need to also think how we can under it, an expanded membership uh, organize the decision-making and making it efficient. So these are kind of the big blocks in terms of policy agenda at the European level that I would see. Thank you. Thank you so much. And finally, uh, Giancarlo. Thank you. Yeah, does, does it work? 
No, it is. Yeah. Um, I'm glad I'm here. I feel like I went 80 days around the world with a different ending instead of being one day before I was 20 minutes late. But uh, sorry about the, the <laughs> being late. The, uh, so I, I am here in, in my capacity of a, a, a you know, like weak, weak replacement of Pisani and uh, at one point also Zettelmeyer in dealing with the uh, uh, RPN, uh, that I rename European Economic Policy out of uh, goodwill. And uh, I am facing as an academic, you know, a, an agenda, a play that is extremely complex and exciting, climate, uh, energy, the war, health risk, you know, you name it, geopolitical, e EU as a geopolitical actor. So to, to some extent, you know, the EMU architecture as part of European economic policy seems a little bit boring. You know, it's, it's backward looking, it's stuck. Uh, uh, progress is nail-like. And uh, frankly speaking, you know, we, 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 it's very difficult to uninge the actors from their conviction, from their beliefs you know, that have been consistently following uh, from the very beginning, despite the experience in the, in the last few years. So instead of adding to the agenda today, I would like to play with it and trying to think whether there's a way to, to unblock it, to make it less stuck. And uh, the way to do it usually is back to the future. I see Barry Eichengmier, so I go back to history. Actually, a little bit more back than I thought. And uh, the one question that we, we, we perhaps want to ask to think about the agenda is, as EMU deliver on its core business of one market, one money? After all, no, we did the, the, the EU because we wanted the euro as an element of a single market. We thought the single market could not exist without a single currency, right? So the question, has it delivered, or actually another way to, to ask the question, has it created problems for the single market? So if I look back, we had uh, one decade of uh, great moderation that in Europe became the great misallocation, right? Capital flows from downhill, funny, good, rich to poor, wrong place, it goes to the wrong place. He flows with the wrong instrument, short-term lending by banks. Suicidal, right? So the great comparative advantage of the 2000 was to, you know, specialize in non-tradable protected sector in some countries, having the luck of having a China going for the core, so they could sell their BMWs there. But at the end, you know, the idea of a strong euro with comparative advantage with complexity is not there is there in a very fragmented way. Then we go to the 2010, as the single market be held by the crisis. Well, you know, there was a massive dissipation of human physical capital. All the, you know, specialized people working in, 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 uh, in uh, factories, factories closed down. So in, in a way also, I remember the link is between macro inability to respond to the crisis and micro allocation. In both cases, in the 2000 with the great misallocation, in the 2010 with, with the crisis. And the end of the crisis was a big fragmentation that still, you know, haunt hunt our, our, our dealing with Europe. So you may ask, okay, what is the difference between heterogeneity and fragmentation? Well, there is a difference. And let me ask you a, some, some, some simple question. Do we really have a single market where firms selling the same shoes with the set to the same people goes across the street, across the border, and have borrowing costs that are like one third? Okay, so th this is the, the inheritance of the crisis. And people may say, well, it's, it's the problem of the country that didn't put the house in order, whatever. But the single market has this uh, problem now that there is a, a large fragmented market with vastly uh, asymmetric debt over rank. Or if you go back to the, to the, to the discussion at the beginning, there was this, this fear that the lack of stabilization capacity would actually bring about enormous incentive for government to, to cheat on the single market, to deviate from the single market for stabilization issue. Like, you know, in industrial policy comes to mind. I remember industrial policy, to my knowledge today, but I live so far from Brussels, maybe, Brussels, maybe I, I'm, I'm not uh, very well informed. Industrial policy to me today is that every country is doing its own stuff. Uh, uh, and that is not the single market. And it's not even, and, and, and this thing has a macro aspect because, you know, 
the memory of a macro framework that cannot deliver is present there and uh, it sort of give governments food for thought whether or not that they should actually act on their own interest rather than thinking that there is a, a known interest also in the single market. So there is no industrial policy for the single market. Yes, I, I'm there. So you may say, okay, but you know, the fragmentation made everybody worse off, but not everybody in the same way. Actually, they were winners or losers. So going ahead, there will be political opposition. Well, yes and no, because the kind of tail risk that we face now with climate, energy transition, uh, and health risk, and the geopolitical tail risk, I'm not sure it will create the same kind of winners and losers that we saw in 2010. So th there is actually food for thought and incentives for thinking that maybe the way in which we, we approach the Reform of Stability Group Act, the leveraging in a way that is, that is not, that, that brings that overrun center stage, that overrun comes from debt existing, but also from the way you deal with that, may create further, further damage. So there, there is a way to think that maybe we should approach the reform of EMU from the single market. I know we have been discussing with Rolf, uh, and I think this is a theme that uh, it would be interesting to, to articulate. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, so my, well, I have very few jobs. One is to make sure this session runs on time. Another one is to try and get some lively disagreement um, from the panel. Um, so I suppose my kind of open question is, are you all completely in alignment on everything that has been said? <laughs> um, and if not, where, where would you go further? Where would you kind of hide, like, um, different things? I mean, I was, I was very impressed by this manifesto having such a long list of signatories. And then I think I read a sentence that says, uh, not everyone necessarily signs up to each one, um, which, which hinted that there might have been some controversy on some of them or disagreement. So could you kind of draw out where that was? Um, Okay, no, um, no, thank you very much. Uh, too much alignment uh, in, uh, here. Uh, so let me, no, let me, let me just uh, make a couple of points of, of uh, if not disagreement, uh, you know, nuances uh, at least. Okay, qualify majority voting, essential to do that, and to do that not after, not in parallel, but before the next enlargement. 35 plus uh, members, I think it would lead to paralysis. However, it is not a substitute for converging on uh, aims. Uh, okay, I'll give you one example of the some of us, uh, Lucas is here, uh, see Vitor there, we lived through in the past uh, uh, 10 years. July 2015, discussion on Greece, whether Greece should remain part of the Eurozone or not. Now, my fear is that, okay, I'm not absolutely certain, but had we had qualifying majority voting on that decision at that time, with the strong pressure of Wolfgang Schäuble to agree to take a vacancy and uh, to go out and maybe re-enter later, so jeopardize, I think, the integrity of the Eurozone, I think we would have, we would have uh, um, risked you know, a lot. So this is, uh, in a sense, the fact that they, sh they, they were not a substantive agreement on the final goals, then on, this, on intermediate goals you can disagree. But I think that would have been. Second example is vaccines. There, actually, the, what happened is that the commission was allowed to go out and, uh, and do what they have, they have to do on, on uh, you know, procurement and all the rest, precisely because there was unanimity. Why so? Because members did not fear that there would be a power grabbing of the commission at that moment, because they, they could have stopped that any moment. Mm? So in a sense here, it was the, the element there facilitated the, the, uh, the decision. Now, these are uh, qualifications on, uh, on matters which, uh, on, on, on an issue which I restate should be uh, reformed, so the decision making. 
but that is not the so it is not a substitute for for the actual um, go, uh, you know converged on goals, and uh, and also there is what we have uh, in Europe right now is the fact that even the modus operandi is such that even when you have qualified majority, you seek for consensus anyway. So you go on uh, until uh, you are exhausted and you get to consensus on uh, all the... So I think there is an element here of uh, forma mentis that uh, will have to be, will have to be um, uh, reviewed. Let me say one final thing is on the integration of migrants. Okay, here I disagree with, uh, with uh, Rolf. Uh, saying that, okay, control of the borders should be for the EU, integration of migrants should be for the uh, individual countries. I think in terms of delivery, I would agree. In terms of financing of this, showing that Europe is actually helped on the front, uh, I think it should be a matter also for the EU and not only the, the world to the member states. So on the financing, you may have a point. It depends a bit also on the question what I said before. Of course, if you if you agree on a common flow of migrants, then there needs to also be a system of distribution that works mm -hmm. and of financing that distribution at the same time how migrants are integrated into the national workforce will be very much dependent on national security systems and I don't see that being kind of completely mm -hmm. harmonized or financed by the EU. I don't I think then, then it may go too far. Let me take up two small points. The one is what you mentioned on creditor debtor. For me, this is a bit, when I think about, also when I think about ESM forward looking as a crisis resolution mechanism, my view on crisis forward looking, yes, we may have, so to speak, the past crisis that we know from the past, from the, the sovereign debt crisis, but if I think forward looking, it's much more the shocks that come with climate, much more broad-based shocks where you may be also acting on an EU level. And so the debtor-creditor issue is for me a bit an issue of the past, not necessarily how we think about the future. And we should gear our tools towards that, also keeping in mind that maybe more precautionary action can be more helpful um, <clears throat> and not only stick to the past image. And that also has to do then with the political dynamics because I think Forward-looking, uh, when I, the qualified majority has not to do for me with, say, Angela Merkel, you mentioned Wolfgang Schäuble, it's also about Orban or whomever you can think of who can block a uh, necessary decision. So from that perspective, this, in my view, forward-looking, the issue of what is addressed at the European level or at the Euro area level has become way more variable with Brexit and thinking about the shocks, we should find efficient solutions that work for the areas, but um, it is not linked to, say, the past pattern as much anymore. Second point on bottom-up uh, capital market union, I perfectly agree that for a true capital market union, we need to have, in a way, a top-down approach in a sense of having sufficiently harmonized supervision and um, enforcement of rules and sufficient in, in a common rule book. At the same time, if you think about the development of capital markets, capital markets are too small. And we ha cannot have a capital market union without a capital market. So there's a lot to be done on national pension systems in order to actually first broaden the capital market. And I think it's at least worth a thought before entering with a problem of harmonizing and creating common supervision to let, so to speak, capital market grow first organically and broaden it up and then try as we go along to move towards more harmonization and centralization by way of making it just politically economy in terms more digestible and more productive from the start because otherwise you may have an infighting at the start on the respective authority and you miss the opportunity just for deepening and broadening markets per se. So I, I guess on this last point, it's a little bit of an endogeneity issue, right? I mean, because if you want to grow the, uh, the capital market, uh, definitely it would help to have uh, this uh, top-down uh, structure with, uh, which would impose uh, some harmonization, something we haven't managed to do with the bottom-up. And if you think about the size of securitization, for example, in, in Europe, 
compared to uh, uh, the size of security eggs market in the US. I mean, we clearly, I think it's something like a third or something like that. So uh, if you manage to, uh, to uh, and, and, and you know, I, I, I agree that there's pension funds, et cetera, but it's not only that. There's a whole pool of assets here that, you know, under proper regulation, uh, could be uh, actually unleashed and could also unlock some more funding than uh, by the banks. So uh, I, I, I think there are, there's definitely an endogeneity issue, but given that in the past, the past shows we haven't made any progress, okay, and it's becoming quite uh, urgent in, given the scale of financing needs for the green transition. I'm not even talking about digitalization and all that. Given the fact that our startups do not seem also to have <laughs> you know, a pool of capital which is nearly comparable to what's going on in the US, I think um, uh, something a little bit more drastic uh, in the Lagarde Kantian uh, framework here should happen. Did, did Giancarlo, did you want to add any more let spice me. to the fight? Or um <laughs> <laughs> Let me pass from this round here. I, I was late. And okay, I, I okay, fine, great. Um, okay, well then at that point, I think I should open it up to <coughs> questions. Um, can we, um, is there a microphone? Yeah. That's good. Can we have, yeah, Martin and then Sarah, don't you know, and then Silvana? Uh, hi, uh, Martin Sandberg, Financial Times. I'd like to hear a bit more about uh, rethinking the budget, as, as Rolf mentioned. Uh, he didn't say much about how he would rethink the budget, nor did the others, but it's clearly crucial, given that the next budget period will possibly span a very big enlargement and definitely uh, be valid for a time, a very different economic time than what the previous one was written for and, and the ones before that. Uh, so. Just, I'd like to hear your thoughts, and maybe you can comment specifically on, on one or two uh, things that sort of I have come across. Um, I heard one credit country policymaker discuss this uh, and talk about how, well, we know that there'll be both pressure and economic logic for a much bigger budget. We can sort of see how we'll be pressured into that, but we would like it to be much less redistributive and much more focused on actual European public goods. Any thoughts uh, on that idea? Uh, the other thing I've noticed that's relevant here is in the Group of Twelve paper and also from several uh, of the German leaders, there's a proposal for QMV specifically on fiscal decisions as well as foreign policy decisions, but this is sort of a quid pro quo. Uh, how would QMV on fiscal decisions kind of work, interact with rethinking the budget? What might it look like? What should it look like? Thanks very much. Thanks. Uh, André Sapir from uh, Bruegel uh, University of Brussels and CPR. Now, I'm also one of the signatories of the uh, manifesto, and you know, I think uh, we all agree more or less on the, the consensus that there was on this, uh, on this panel. But I wonder uh, whether this partly technocratic uh, discussion um, is really meeting the, uh, the challenges. Um, don't we need more politics in this? And um, there is one word that was not pronounced, the F word, uh, federalism. Now, I never was, um, until recently, I was never big on, on federalism. Uh, I thought that it was a complete dream and completely unrealistic. But given the, uh, the types of problems that we are dealing with today, uh, including potentially the, uh, the return of uh, President Trump uh, in a year from now, climate, all of those discussions, uh, all of the issues that were, that were mentioned, uh, I really wonder whether the, um, the current treaty, the current approach, um, including what is being proposed in the manifesto for the rebuilding of, of an, uh, an agenda for Europe, I really wonder whether it's up to the, to the task. I wonder whether there is not a huge gap between the type of challenges that are in front of us and that citizens have in front of them. I mean, if we take seriously the uh, climate issue, it implies a huge transformation of our economies. And I very much worry 
that you know this discussion around in some sense industrial policy this is going to be destructive of Europe because we know from history I think I think I know where industrial policy is leading us it is leading us not to so far a European industrial policy it's leading us to national industrial policies because in the end that's that's all that we have we have some kind of a framework but in the end it's going to be national and the national industrial policy is what in a sense started us with the single market project that was in a sense the the vision that it was it was just not meeting the the challenges and so the industrial policy at the time of Europe was was the single market that's what it was and it was a European response now I very much fear that now we are embarked into national responses not up to the climate transformation and certainly not up to the geopolitical discussion what's going to happen when Trump comes back uh, and what's going to happen with uh, with Ukraine uh, okay, we are talking about enlargement and you know how we, we change the budget and we do other things. But how are we going to meet the political challenges dealing with Ukraine? Not about enlargement to the EU, to the Ukraine, but the problem of Ukraine at, at our borders. Even if Ukraine stays outside uh, of the EU, it's going to be a, a real, uh, real issue. Thank and you. I can't see how the current political setup <coughs> is going to be able to deal with that. Thank you. Um, and then finally to Silvana. Sorry. Thank you. Um, uh, just a comment <laughs> and a question. Um, so it seems that the prudential approach that Ellen is proposing is extremely important and extremely urgent. And I wonder if it could be broadened to think about the prevention, mitigation, and resolution of shortages of critical inputs more broadly, not just energy. And the risk come not just from climate risk, but also geopolitical risk. And I wonder um, about your thoughts about that. Great, thank you. Um, okay, well, should we take those in reverse order, Helen? Do you want to respond to this specific question to you? Yes, so great question. Um, so uh, so there's a bit, of, in, my, in my mind, there's a bit of a, a slight trade-off here because the prudential approach I'm proposing, which essentially uh, is about some kind of dynamic scoring to produce uh, public goods at the European level or even the global level, so rests on this kind of assessment of expected cost and how we can decrease them. And it's pretty clear that for the COVID, we had a relatively simple, I mean, nothing is simple, but simple example in the sense that the costs were immediate and the investment needed in order to reduce them were also, to some extent, we could put some numbers. So we could have, you know, big standard deviation, but they could kind of be there. So it could be, in a sense, almost uh, <coughs> calculated with, with, with some margin of, of error, but we could, we could do this exercise. It was relatively well defined. Now, the big uh, global risk in front of us is climate, or there would be things like these rare minerals, etc., that we need for. Uh, and, and so I'm thinking that we should concentrate on a few of those, but not many, because it cannot be a very broad approach that could be stretched in, very direc in many directions, and then we would have very, a very lax framework uh, for the EU budget. But we should pick our priorities. And if we think that indeed for the green transition, one way to narrow down the problem would be to have access to these rare materials and uh, to, to make sure that we can, uh, we can do the, the green transition in the most, uh, the quickest possible way at the lowest cost, then we should really put our energy on, on that, put numbers, kind of come up with an investment proposal and do this dynamic scoring and say, you know, if we invest now 50 billion, that means that we are gonna save an expected 120 billion at the European level later. Uh, with a credible thing. So we have to, <laughs> to, to, to take important priorities on which we can somehow put a number. Obviously, there's a lot of difficulty behind that. I'm totally aware, that's why I'm saying this is also a bit of my academic hat I'm discussing this. But I think, you know, we have we've been able to put numbers on, on, on many things. Uh, climate models are not <laughs> really simple and we still are, are being able to put numbers on these things. So. Why not, okay? And, 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 and that could be a, a, another example. We should pick uh, the priorities we want to tackle with that, but I, I would be totally in favor of discussing more about this. Thank you. Okay, so then, oh. Just, I, mean, I was not listening, but the, the prudential approach is European level, right? Because <laughs> other, uh, the ideal, you know, the, Europe is large enough to have a prudential to approach that is also 
So again, coming back to, to Andre discussion, influential approach means every, I remember like a few years ago when everybody came here in, in Mannheim saying that we secure the future of uh, Italy to a pipeline to Russia. Uh, and it was, uh, it was funny to hear that. Uh, uh, so th that this kind of influential approach we don't want, right? No. <laughs> Great, okay, well, so we had another question about whether we need more politics, whether a heavy dose of technocracy is really fit for the challenges that, that we face. Any, any comment on that? The technocrats like the technocracy. Okay, <laughs> okay we, uh, we happen to be technocrats, uh, so it's, uh, <laughs> we'll have to, we'll have to uh, undergo a genetic mutation, which is not easy. Um, now, um, okay, I think, Andre, I think you are fully right. I, uh, I mean, we, in the manifesto, we agonized on whether to use the F word or not. Uh, there were some actually excellent people who decided at the end of the day not to sign because we had decided to put in the, uh, what we called gradual and uh, um, pragmatic federalism. And there, uh, you know, uh, they decided, no, 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 we don't go on board there because it's too divisive. But I think what the way you argue, I think, is, uh, is absolutely um, uh, essential. And I think on, uh, I, I would be a little bit more optimistic, uh, since it's rather gloomy here, on, uh, on, the, on the EU industrial policy. I think we have, there is a way, uh, I think, to, by linking it to European public goods, to reform the budget, uh, to have a look at the, a uh, new look at the single market to avoid that we end up uh, into the state aid uh, approach to industrial policy. But that, at the end of the day, is what, uh, what, what it is. Uh. Um, here, uh, I have to say the um, alliance of countries uh, is a deadly one because uh, you have, uh, I mean, Germany and France disagree massively on many, many things. They, you know, miraculously converge on that state aid. Huh? And uh, you know, 80% of the of uh, aid uh, authorized by the Commission uh, is comes from these two countries. So I think that is. Uh, but I think there is uh, arg uh, good arguments. I think to uh, look again at EU industrial uh, industrial policy. Now I published uh, uh, actually yesterday or the day before in a little piece in Bruegel uh, on analysis on the reform of the EU budget. Uh, you can find there be what uh, I uh, think about that. I think the, at the end of the day, one should, div should reorganize the budget by and large on two big chapters. One is indeed genuine, true European public goods, so financed and delivered at the European level, and then on the other, on uh, um, posts, on items which imply um, transfer to member states, I think we should adopt as far as possible the NG and Next Generation EU RRF uh, uh, approach, which is moved to a performance-based, so output-based, uh, rather than the input-based system that we have now, according to which you just send the, the invoice to Brussels. Now, the final thing is that the, the uh, ideas um, put forward by Hélène are in a report uh, uh, actually uh, published by uh, uh, asked by Commissioner Gentiloni, that was one of my first, my, the last thing in my previous life, uh, who were, fell victim of uh, Mr. Putin because it was released the same week as the Russian invasion. But he had many ideas, uh, so I think it would be worth uh, fishing it back. Great. I think Andre was one of the authors also beside Ellen. Okay, I have, I have, we have one minute left, so you're gonna help me do my one job, which is to end on time. Um, brief, brief thoughts? On, um, my way of thinking about the budget. So I, I can fully agree with what uh, Marco said in terms of setting incentives and having sufficient money for public goods. My way of thinking about it and selling it is precisely in the division of labor that I said between EU level and national level. And the incentive should be that overall you save. Insurance is more efficient if it's aggregated up. Fooling is more efficient. I'm not saying that the EU budget cannot increase, but it can only increase if you make it more efficient. And the sum of national and EU money is less than the national level doing everything. And that is the way I think for me the key incentive that, or the key selling point, if you wish, to, to go about it and think about it. Um, on Great. federalism I, I and the capital market, I see all the benefits 
the question is, is first best attainable or is it not attainable? And if it's not attainable, can we live, can we more make more progress on the second best? And that is what I would advocate. Great. Okay, Giancarlo, very briefly, because we're now, we're now over. Oh, yeah, no, no, j yes? just a, a, a note. So I think it would be helpful to distinguish the stabilization of large shocks that doesn't require a large budget always. Re requires leverage capacity and decision to intervene when the large shock uh, happens, not to make it bigger. Like, you know, the GFC became bigger in Europe because we didn't have the stability. So that thing needs leverage and determination and a framework that, and then the public good and everything else, which I think is best approached with the idea of a structural micro single market. So it's really, it's not the deficit. There, the question is the content of the spending and where we put it. So if we think about this, I think it's helpful. We don't go on a large budget, a large deficit. From a stabilization, actually, could be, you know, very, very so hopefully rare, hopefully rare. Mm -hmm. But but for, for the public goods, maybe the, the other approach on the content of what we do is more appropriate. Great. Okay, now I want to apologize to the um, organizers who I'm sure spent months and months painstakingly getting every, everyone on the same page, only for um, unruly journalists to try and find the um, points of disagreement. Um, so forgive me, um, and uh, thanks for listening. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.